That's hello, everybody. Zane Goodall is one of the world's most prominent experts on chimpanzees. She has devoted her life to animal welfare, human rights, and the environment. Goodall spent 55 years studying wild chimpanzees at the Gombe Stream National Park in Tanzania. During her research, Goodall discovered that chimpanzees could make and use tools and that they have personalities and emotions similar to human beings. In 1977, Goodall established the Jane Goodall Institute, a global organization committed to conserving and protecting chimpanzee habitats. The Institute's Roots and Shoots program focuses on empowering students to work on environmental, conservation, and humanitarian issues. In 1986, Goodall changed her focus from observing chimpanzees to becoming an activist for human rights, animal protection, and environmental conservation. Today, at the age of 82, Jane Goodall travels the world 300 days a year to promote awareness for endangered chimpanzees, human rights, and protecting the environment. After speaking at an event for the Roots and Shoots branch in Beijing, Goodall stopped by her studio to talk about her life and career. Good afternoon and welcome to Beijing. Welcome back to Beijing, yes, I should. Back to do, you, Beijing. do you visit China a lot these, these years? Now? I've been visiting for 30 years and I used to come once a year, now it's once every other year because I have to go to so many other countries. Yeah, it's still, I'm the, uh, the crazy legendary story, 300 days out of a year you're on the road. Yes, and that's after living from 1960 to 1986 out in the forest. What a difference. <laughs> I see you brought this doll with you. Mr. H, right? It the is, famous Mr. This H. Is the famous Mr. H, given to me by a man who went blind when he was 21, Gary Horn, that's mm -hmm. why it's Mr. H, decided to be a magician. I mean, he said, well, I'm going to try. And the children don't know he's blind. So uh, then he'll say, if things go wrong in your life, don't give up. There's always a way forward. Mm. And he just published a book of paintings, a blind man. He's done a beautiful portrait of Mr. H. Just by holding him and feeling him, he's got him onto the paper. It's unbelievable. Mm. Actually, the other day when I went there to hear you speak, uh, you also talked about Mr. H. But at the same time, you mentioned the tail story. That's right, because Gary Horn uh, gave him to me 24 years ago for my birthday. And thought he was giving me a stuffed chimpanzee, and I made him hold the tail. Yeah. My Gary, chimpanzees don't have tails. You know what? I mean, before you told that story, I didn't realize chimpanzees don't have tails. There's five great apes, biologically, five uh -huh. great apes. Uh, the most like us are chimpanzees, not, not this guy, he's a monkey, uh, chimpanzees <laughs> like this, uh -huh. um, bonobos, and then gorillas, the other big African ape, and the Asian one, orangutan, and the fifth great ape, you and me. Mm. Biologically, we differ from these guys by just over 1% of our DNA. I mean, I think the big difference between them and us is the way our brain has developed this intellect mm. and you know think what we've done with our intellect it's amazing isn't it if you talk about your experience your research life in Africa in Tanzania with the chimpanzees what do you think is your biggest or most important success out of that 38 years in Africa you know when I first began and I was told by my mentor, Louis Leakey, that I had to get a degree because when I went to Africa, I hadn't been to college. Mm. We couldn't afford it. And he got me a place to do a PhD. He said there was no time for a BA. And I went to Cambridge University in England. Yeah. And at that time, 1962, it was truly science believed there was a sharp line with humans on one hand and the other animals on the other side. And I was told that I shouldn't have given the chimpanzees names, that wasn't scientific. <laughs> and I couldn't talk about their personalities, their minds, right. or their emotions. But I'd been taught by my childhood teacher, that was my dog. My dog taught me. I mean, you can't share your life with any animal and not know that they have personalities, minds, and emotions. They can feel happy or sad. 
So I think because biologically chimps are so like us, you know, the DNA and the immune system and the anatomy of the brain and everything, that, that enabled me to push the fact that psychologically and behaviorally they're so like us as well. And mm. finally, science began to accept it. And now we know birds can use and make tools. We know that a bumblebee can be taught to pull on a string to pull up a little drop of nectar. Nobody would have believed that five years ago. It's very exciting. A new approach to see the world again. Yes, I and the chimps began that. It was the chimpanzees, because they're so like us, that really opened the door for the other animals. Do you think human beings doing research, going to where they live, do you think this is also an intrusion? Well, it, it, it could be. It could be if you get too much tourism. But I think just me out in the forest sitting <laughs> quietly, I don't think I was intrusive. They tried to drive me away at first. You know, first they were frightened and ran away. Mm. Then they treated me like a predator, shook branches, and you know, they're much stronger than we are. Mm. Um, but I, I pretend that I wasn't interested, <laughs> and I dug little holes in the ground, and I suppose eventually they thought, oh, she's harmless. They accepted you. And they accepted me. I never tried to get into their lives, just to be allowed to, like, look through a window. Mm. Do you still go back to uh, Gombe? Yeah, twice a year. Twice a year. Just short. The chimps I used to know are gone now. You know, they can live to be 60 years, but it's 55 years since we began. Yeah. And there are very few that I know really well. Do you still do research now? I don't do the research, but I direct the students. Mm. So I got the research station there. Mm. We do all kinds of different research now. But to be just out in the forest, it's very important for me, spiritually. But, but somehow you shifted your focus from being a scientist in Africa of over 30 years to being an uh, environmentalist. That was in 1986. Yeah. Why then? What happened? There was a big conference. So at that time, we brought people in from the eight different parts of Africa where chimps were being studied by then. Mm -hmm. And there was a session on conservation. And it was shocking. So everywhere, chimp numbers dropping, forests being cut down, chimpanzee mothers killed. We had a, another session on conditions in captive situations, the cruel treatment of chimpanzees used in circuses and entertainment, the beating, um, the fact that the chimpanzees, they may look cute and sweet and do little tricks, but it's based on absolute fear and also in medical research labs, cages of five foot by five foot, secretly filmed footage. Mm. And I just left as a different person. And mm. to realize that we can't try and protect the chimpanzees while people are suffering, we need to have and improve the lives of the people mm. so that they want to help us conserve the forest and the chimpanzees because they see the value of it. So how do you see the species, how do you see chimpanzees? Another race, just like human beings, they also have feelings? They certainly have feelings. They have their own individual lives, they have family relationships, and they need to be treated with respect. We need to respect the animals. Um, we need to respect people of other nations, other cultures, other religions. The respect is such an important word. You've been working on your campaign for decades, but at the same time, people still do not have enough knowledge of the message you're trying to convey. That's A, that's why I'm still traveling 300 <laughs> days a year at 82. <laughs> B, you know, I'm very passionate about the wilderness and wildlife, and I, can, I could work my whole life just trying to protect animals and save forests, but if new generations don't grow up to be better stewards than we've been, it's a waste of my time. And we'll just run out of natural resources. So that's why our program for youth roots and shoots is to me so very important and that keeps me traveling. And it's very encouraging that wherever I go, there are young people, people your age, who come up and say, I was in your roots and shoots program when I was a child. And I say, well, did it make any difference? 
And they say, well, yes, because I understand about the environment and I understand that animals have feelings and emotions and we shouldn't be cruel to them. So definitely you're feeling the progress being made year by year. Absolutely, and especially in China, actually. I mean, so many, many, during even the short time, Chengdu and Beijing, uh, the number of people who've come up to me and thanked me for helping them understand more about the natural world. Mm. I went to the one in Beijing, the, uh, the summit, the seminar you had, great turnout. Lots of young students mm. coming from around the country mm. attending that activity and many of them actually were selling goods to support this campaign. Just, just amazing. I mean, Roots and Shoes has been running in China for over 20 years. Mm, 30. How would you, 30. Mm. So h how would you describe this project in China? Well, first of all, uh, the Roots and Shoots group is young people of any age. Mostly it's kind of, you know, six years old up through university. And each group themselves choose three projects, one to help people, one to help animals, including dogs and cats and mm. cows, and one to help the environment. And so together as a group, they do three projects like that, and they're all passionate about what they choose to do. Mm. And they share the information with each other. Mm. And we, as often as we can, bring them together like you saw. I mean, it's amazing what young people are doing to help the world. When you empower them, mm to take action and they roll up their sleeves and they get out and they're planting organic gardens, they're changing trash into sometimes clothes, um, mm. they're cleaning up wetlands, mm. uh, they, they just, they have so many ideas. Mm. What do you think is the most difficult part? Well, there's always a difficulty in raising money everywhere, all around the world, that's, that's, that's given. Financial but support, sponsorship. Financial support, sponsorship. That's, you know, for all that we're doing in Africa or mm. wherever. Um, most difficult, some schools are reluctant to, to kind of welcome the program in. And then I always say to the kids, if you want to do the program, never mind the school, do it at home. Perhaps your parents will get involved. You just need a group of friends and you decide what you want to do it, you, you do it. What are the main reasons they didn't welcome the project? Like I think it's maybe teachers who are overworked and they don't understand that this won't give them extra work. Sometimes uh, a government will ask us for a curriculum. So if you have a curriculum in the school, then the Roots and Shoots philosophy is taught, which is about protecting the environment and wildlife and mm. being kind to animals and helping people. The sort of things we all should be doing. Mm. But we are growing. I mean, you know, nearly a thousand groups now. Mm. And so it's growing. What are you trying to achieve or what do you hope to achieve with a campaign with a focus on young students say in China? A, a critical mass of young people who understand yes we do need money to live but it goes wrong when we live for money mm -hmm. and it's putting the bottom line ahead of thinking about future generations mm -hmm. so we hear the saying we haven't inherited this planet from our parents We've borrowed it from our children. Mm. And I always say, we haven't borrowed from our children. We've been stealing their future. But when they grow up, when they see all these complications in all, all the society of the world, do you think sometimes they would have to compromise? I mean, do you Yeah, they do. Across? They do have to compromise. And it makes some of them really, really upset. And so I have to talk to them and say, look, you have to make a living in this world. So you know, don't worry too much, but just keep that little core inside yourself and the time in your life will come when you can pay back. So I find a lot of like grandparents, mm. you know, they now, they're doing everything they can to help the, the, the grandchildren and to think about their future. You're trying to uh, cultivate a new lifestyle for this younger generation in the future. Yeah, a new, a new lifestyle all over the world of people who understand that nature is important for us mm. and if we destroy nature and the different animal species, in the end that will destroy us.
you think the environment has been improving for the chimps compared to when you first started? Oh no, it's ago? much worse. There's far, far less forest. Far less forest. But we are now working with other groups and we are very determined to save and, and not only save the forest but create corridors to link one forest with another so that the chimpanzees don't get trapped and the other animals too. So if you save chimpanzees you're saving all the other amazing animals who live in those forests. How come it's getting worse? I mean, people like yourself working so hard for so many more years. More and more and more people eating away their territory. Foreign companies coming in, building roads, building dams. Do you think we can reverse things. that trend? Well, we're sort of beginning to. I mean, the, I think, you know, people, politicians and so on, big companies are really beginning to think in a different way like the the oil and gas companies they've come to understand that the general public is more educated now the general public if they can choose between uh, some oil got in a dirty way and energy from the sun providing the sun's energy is not more expensive they're going to choose the sun so the wise companies are moving to clean, green energy. And mm. China has a lead in this. I mean, some of the uh, solar developments in China are ahead of other countries. And so moving in that direction, just for profit, doesn't matter why you do it. Some people do it because they care about the environment and the future. Some people do it because they're smart enough to see this is what's going to sell in the future. So let me be ahead mm. and get the best solar, the best wind or whatever it happens to be. Interesting you mentioned the oil and energy company because some of your sponsors of your campaign, Roots and Shoots, are actually oil and energy companies. Yes, and I've, I've discussed this very openly with them and said, you know, there are a lot of of my colleagues who are angry that I would take money from an oil and gas company. But because they are uh, the ones who may accuse, you know, damaging the environment. And sometimes they do. Some do it much more than others. But the point is, I couldn't travel around the world. I couldn't have got here today without using the product from these companies. So it would be very hypocritical to use the oil and gas for my own life and say, yes, but you're so dirty and horrible that I won't touch any of your money. If that money is being used, and I told them this, I said, you realize you're sponsoring Roots and Shoots and we are educating these people to be your customers of the future who probably won't want to buy your product unless you move in this direction. And so you have to think about things honestly mm. and you have to realize that you know some things are, are not good but it's not necessarily that people are bad it's that they don't know any other way to go or the competition is so intense and they've got to make a life a living mm. so the world is difficult it's not black and white on any sponsorships you would refuse to accept Yes, I won't take anything from something like a tobacco company because they're killing people. Um, and I wouldn't take anything from people manufacturing arms and weapons. Couldn't do that. Mm, that's the bottom line. Yes, and there are some oil companies I wouldn't touch. Still, also oil company? Yes, I mean some of them responsible for these terrible oil spills and not, not using nearly enough money to clean them up. Mm. Can you accept animal for medical research? Usually not, mainly because I've learned so much about it and that most of it has not actually benefited human health. And if we put the resources into the alternative ways of testing drugs, that's actually so much safer. Because even chimpanzees, so like us, a lot of medicine that uh, works on them is harmful for us mm. and the other way around, because there are those differences. So if we can use, you know, human cells and things like that, then we, we'd actually be much further on. Mm. What about zoos? Wild animal zoos? Or well, zoos and zoos. Zoos in the cities? It depends on the zoo. And it depends on the animal. I don't think, I don't think whales and dolphins and things should ever be in captivity. They need the ocean. Elephants, unless you've got a huge space, 
I just feel so sorry for elephants. Chimpanzees, a lot of other animals, if they have space, if they have an enriched environment so that they have something to do, because they get bored, stiff, just sitting in a cage. If they have keepers who understand them, uh, then their lives can be useful in that they can help children understand how wonderful they are, mm. and that helps to conserve the ones out in the wild. In but you know, there are so many bad zoos. How, I mean, what, what zoos are bad zoos? Well, the bad zoos are ones where an animal is in a small concrete cell with nothing to do, with no comfort, with perhaps no companions, and uh, totally the wrong environment, mm. and nobody really understanding them, and people allowed to tease them. And those animals, if they are in the wild, they might be poached or they might just, just die. Yeah, they might. So they might. So which side of the story is a good story? I mean, in a zoo, they, well, they're being taken care of. That's what I'm saying. In a good zoo, they can probably uh, be safer than many places in the wild. That's right. So we try to save the really wild places where the animals can be safe. That's the best. <laughs> but also... You know, I've watched chimpanzee groups in really good zoos where there's a good group and there's a couple of babies and think, well, they're having a really good life. Mm. You also have a huge campaign about protecting the elephants. I find that many people don't, well, especially in China somehow, don't understand that these, this ivory comes from elephants who've been very cruelly slaughtered and poached. Mm. Uh, the families ties are broken and young elephants learn culture from the elders so if the elders have gone a lot of these young elephants who managed to survive they they behave like um, unruly street kids kids on drugs they don't know how to behave and they go on the rampage and they you know that they just behave like unruly teenagers mm. with nobody to discipline them in China, we have a long history of ivory carving. Mm, I know. And now we have actually introduced the new policy of banning all ivory products. Mm. And there was a businesswoman who was actually sent to jail yeah. in Africa not yep. long ago. Yep. So the government is doing what they are supposed to do to, to introduce the ban policy to protect the elephants. But at the same time, people are thinking, well, so what a waste and we've been developing this craftsmanship this tradition for hundreds of years and all of a sudden mm. it's gone nothing's black and white but I think we have to find a way that that craft which is so wonderful can be used on a different substance you mean alternatives yes alternatives alternatives to the use of animals in medical research uh, or like films now films are being made instead of trying to train chimpanzees to behave in inappropriate ways. They're making these incredible ones like in um, Planet of the Apes, where it's not a living chimp at all, it's virtual reality. And they're so real, I've watched it. This is where our brain comes in. This is, we now know it's bad, so let's find another way of doing it. Let's find another way of living. Let's find a different way, mm. which is a more ethical sort of way. Mm. In that event in Beijing, you mentioned five reasons for feeling for hopeful hope. yeah. for the future. Yeah. One is the energy and commitment of young mm. people when they're educated and empowered to take action. They, they're, they're actually teaching their mothers and their grandparents. Mm. Mm. I've met many people in America who say, well, I recycle because my kids make me. <laughs> Two is this resourceful brain. Mm. We are able to think of different ways of doing Intelligence, things. Intelligence. Yeah. Intelligence. And we're able to think of ways of living our own lives in a more ethical way. You know, mm. thinking about the consequences of the choices we make, what we buy, eat, wear, and so on. Thirdly, the resilience of nature. Um, you can have, in China, you know all about polluted rivers, and you certainly know about polluted air. Uh, but we can change those things. It's, it's being, I, I know so many rivers in America which used to catch fire, they were so polluted. They can be cleaned up. Social media, because you can put out information and reach hundreds more people 
who can join your cause mm. than you could do before. And finally, this indomitable human spirit, the people who tackle the impossible and do amazing things and inspire everyone around them. Mm. Like these two Chinese men, one who's completely blind, and the other with no arms, mm. and somehow they met and they decided they'd plant trees and improve the environment. They planted millions of trees. A story like that is just one other example of this indomitable human spirit that somehow we have the ability to overcome disabilities, we have the ability to overcome persecution, we have the ability to overcome all of the problems life puts in our paths. This is an inspirational story, so it inspires other people with disabilities. And that's, that's so important. Every day I live, every day you live, every day everybody who's watching or listening to us now, every day we make a difference. And we have a choice as to what kind of difference we're going to make today. And I think that's the key message, that so many people are aware of the problems, but they feel helpless and hopeless because I'm one person, what can I do? I can't do anything, I'd love to, but I can't change the world. And alone you can't. But when it's millions, billions of people all making more ethical choices, then suddenly, wow, we're moving towards the sort of world that I'll be happier to leave to my grandchildren. Mm -hmm. You, you opened actually the event in Beijing with your chimpanzee language. Yes, yes, my chimp call. Can, can you teach me how to do it? Yes, it's, it's called the pantu because it's all one breath. Uh huh. A ooh, long ooh, one. Ooh. Yes, a long breath. So you go. <laughs> what kind of emotion is that? That's. It's Happy That's or excited? Hello, this is me, Jane, and you were saying that that was you because each chimp has his or her own voice and that's right. how they locate each other in the forest. I mean, the final note of today's program would be to feel hopeful for the future. Yes. Is there a language for that? Well, not really, but I mean, I think the very sound of the chimpanzee calling out in the forest, uh -huh. the fact that they're still there and we're still learning about them, that's hope for the future. Right. Thank you for your time and thank you for sharing with us your stories and your well, thoughts. Thank, thank you. you very much. Shouldn't, we, shouldn't I show you a chimpanzee greeting? Uh, yes, please. Can we stand up okay. with our various okay. let's do it. microphones? Yes, let's because, do it. Because it would be like you're the male yeah. and I'm the female. Yeah. So I'm a little bit nervous because females are, are less dominant. Right. So I'm making my, my nervous greeting. Uh, what I'm, am what I you're doing, do? so you're the big male, mm -hmm. but actually we're friends. So as I come up, <laughs> thank you for telling me the story because I've never actually uh, understood a, a chimpanzee language. Now not to you mention know the, the way of greetings. Right. So once again, thank you, Jane, for okay. your for your time and for, human for your ways. Stories. Thank you. And thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right.